All right, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our next panel will be starting in just a few moments. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're going to ask everyone to kindly take your seats. Our next panel will be starting in just a few moments. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our next panel conversation theme is the future of work. Please welcome to the stage the moderator of our next panel, Pablo Calaver, Managing Director and Partner at Boston Consulting Group and our panel members, Alejandro Anderlich, Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy for Latin America at Salesforce, Nicholas Kaplan, Chief Business Officer at Globant. Gina Marquez, Vice President of Strategy North America for Arch Staffing and Consulting, also COO of Joint to Work, and Karim Mitre, Lead of the Administration and Human Management and Business Development Division at Banco de Credito del Peru, BCP, who will be discussing the challenges and opportunities about developing Latin America's talent pool. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we, we know this uh, schedule is not the, the easiest one right after lunch, uh, but uh, thank you so much for being here together with us. And thank you so much to my colleagues and friends uh, to, to uh, share this time to discuss on the future of work, uh, which is, uh, I think, a hot topic for many of us and definitely a, a, an interesting discussion that we have in front of uh, us in, in, in the next uh, few minutes. Um, I don't know if we are ready. We can perhaps close the door. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So let, let me uh, just share with you a, a few thoughts uh, to serve as an introduction before we jump into the into the roundtable. Uh, I mean, for those uh, that uh, dedicate our time or professional life to to HR, I think we are living very interesting days, very interesting times. So probably for the very first time in the last 20, 30 years. I think we are trending topics. So the HR topics, the, uh, everything that has to do with talent management, the workforce planning, digital talent, has become top of mind of our colleagues or CEOs. Recent study says that uh, priority number two among the CEOs worldwide is uh, HR-related topics, right? Let me share with you a couple of facts. 90% of the companies expect any kind of shortage of talent in the next two years. And that shortage will imply a negative impact on their ability to deliver the, the strategy, to develop new products, to enter new markets, and therefore to grow. It means the shortage of talent has become a roadblock for many, many companies in order to succeed, in order to develop their strategy. Second fact, 60% of the current workforce, 60% of the jobs, are expected to suffer or to require a massive upskilling or reskilling in the next five years. Which basically means that we, as companies, have become responsible for the re-education, the re-skilling of more than one half of the total workforce, more than one half of our employees. We cannot outsource 
that responsibility. We cannot call back to the universities, to the business schools, saying, hey, could you please give us a new group of workers with different skills? No, I mean, it's too late. Especially, and this is the third fact, because these days, especially in the digital world, the technological world, the average duration, the average maturity of a skill, of a technical skills, is around five years, which basically means that even if you have, as of today, a data scientist, uh, an engineer, that is perfectly fit with the position he's, he's, he or she is developing, in five, six, seven years from now, if you do nothing, you will have someone that has become obsolete in terms of competencies, in terms of skills. Last uh, figure I want to share with you. 56% is the percentage of current employees, both in Europe, Latin America, North America, that declare that they are open to explore a new position, a new job, in the next 12 months. If you go to digital profiles, digital professionals, that percentage goes up to 75%. Of course, that has had an impact in, in terms of voluntary attrition. Before the COVID crisis, we were talking about single-digit voluntary attrition in big companies, even tech companies in America and in Europe. As of today, these days, we are close to 22% per year. Okay. So with this introduction, let me uh, say thank you again to, to the panel, Alejandro, Gina, Nicolás, and, uh, and Karim. Uh, so let, let me start with an open question to the four of you, and please feel free to, to jump in, into, into the answers. Uh, given this context, given this, uh, let me call it, war for talent that we, we all have to face, who are your companies uh, preparing or, or acting uh, to deal with a, such a challenging environment? Hello, yeah. Nicolás, yeah. <clears throat> well, yeah, I can start, take at least a st an initial stab at it. Uh, we like to call it, of course, the talent opportunity because actually that's what we do for a living, <laughs> right? And what do we do to seize that opportunity? Well, actually we use two of our main, you know, DNA components. One is education, right? And the other one is collaboration. And what do we mean when, when we say education for, for this aspect, especially in, in Latin America, right? Six, continuing with your facts, uh, outline. Six out of 15 uh, of the main relevant cities in the world mm -hmm. are in Latin America. So, and we already know how, how demand is present and how it will be present. So, yeah, the opportunity is, it is a challenging one, but we, we use education, as I was saying, right? We, we love to get ready for our opportunities to study and, and to keep on reinventing ourselves in that sense. And this same thing that we do for ourselves, we foster it for the community of, you know, Glovers or of potential Glovers, right? Um, we have a, a great program of scholarships that we are giving that would be five times what it is already. We have given already like 3,500 uh, scholarships, but I think that the, more, the most interesting aspect is that it is designed to connect mm. with the critical moments of our people in their lifetimes, right? When they want to get into a technology environment, right? We have a special program called Code Your Future. When they, maybe they have left their jobs for, I don't know, maybe for motherhood purposes, we have a program to get back in the game. When you want to accelerate your career, we have a, a Code Your Future uh, to, to accelerate through your specialization and what you do and you like doing. And also the collaboration with you know, the public sector and the education sector to be in, you know, of course, the large scale places as Sao Paulo or Ciudad de Mexico, but also in the southern city in the world like Ushuaia. So mm -hmm. in the end, it gives us a purpose, which of yeah. course is nowadays so, so important. Yeah, no. Okay, maybe I can tell you what we've done is, we have to do, we've done basically three things. The first one is to reorganize HR. The traditional HR organization it wasn't be able to deliver what we needed. And uh, then we have to make priorities. And the digital profiles are the ones we need. So we created a standalone uh, within HR, a, a standalone uh, digital profile area to focus on all, all the talent acquisition. <coughs> we have to make the upskilling, the reskilling, and, and, mm -hmm. and also the vendor strategy because we have to deal with, we have a lot of, of, of third parties working in our squads in, the, in, in, in agility. And then uh, we've told everyone in the organization, especially the leaders, because leadership here is key, that talent acquisition is their duty, not only HR. 
So that's key if you want to, to start moving this wheel around uh, bringing really talented people into your organization. Alejandro Lady. Gina. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Bon appetit. Um, well, uh, our business is talent. Um, talent economy worth right now uh, over $8 trillion in labor shortages. So I may answer a little bit different this question because uh -huh. our, uh, our responsibility is to be there and look at what is happening at the market. The <coughs> talent is a transversal asset to every industry. So we have identified four uh, main uh, trends that are right now affecting uh, what is the future of work, or uh, we cannot talk about future of work without crisis of talent. So the first one that I would like to, to tell you about is um, the economical pulse. So right now we cannot move or decide what is happening out there in the markets, if there is a recession coming, if there is a, an inflation dr a driver right now, if we don't talk about if companies are hiring or not hiring employees. Mm -hmm. So this influence is super uh, important and has proof that talent is a superpower for the competitiveness of any business. Second trend we identified was uh, what is happening with the disruption of supply chains. I've been here since all morning and everybody is talking about uh, how to integrate our globalization, uh, also talent. But even though we hear about nearshoring, offshoring, reshoring, we are not talking about nearshoring talent, offshoring talent, reshoring talent. So we need to talk about these labor supply chains integration in order to deliver out there in the, in the productive uh, and in the economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, then the third, the third and the fourth trend that we identified are more into um, digital transformation uh, perspective. The first one is, uh, well, let me tell you a story. We right now are developing an, an HR tech corporate venture. And uh, what happened is that two years ago, we went out there to raise funds. It's super interesting what I'm going to tell you, because in every single investor uh, or venture capital or private equity we went, there was no HR tech category. There was healthcare tech. There was financial tech. There was agri-tech. But there was not HR tech uh, category. Right now, last year, the HR tech category raised over $16 billion. And that is four times of the year before. So right now, CEOs are, fa are, are looking at labor shortages as the number, number one trend of the businesses. And finally, well, in an era of automation and industries 4.0, we have to be more human than ever. So talent is the only constant, and we need to start looking at how we're going to reposition these 300 million jobs that are going to be lost due to automation processes. I'm going to stop there. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Alejandro? Yes, Paolo. First of all, I want to start with a big thank you for the Council of Americas for the invitation and for all of you for being here today. Uh, my icebreaker will be giving visibility to a paradox, mm -hmm. which is the fact that we keep talking about future of work like if we were pushing the issue forward, right? And actually, I love the title we see there, which is the talent imperative, this is not something that will happen in the future. The future of work is already in the past. It happened yesterday. We have to take urgent action. And uh, actually, the digital economy is creating amazing opportunities to build uh, a much stronger workforce. And Latin America, which is a region that is so much left behind, with so many people unemployed, so many people who are not happy with their jobs, mm -hmm. so many people who want to reach their first job. I mean, I can't see why we are not in a crowded room. I would like to see this room, I mean, packed with people mm -hmm. trying to find an urgent solution for the problem. Because let's take just uh, the case of uh, the Salesforce economy. Mm -hmm. We conduct a study uh, every year, IDC does that, and what ITC has predicted in the last study is that the Salesforce economy itself 
will bring only in Latin America more than two million jobs in the next four years. Yeah. If we assess that globally, IDC says more than 9.3 million jobs. And that is only the Salesforce ecosystem. Yeah. So why on earth aren't we crowding this room trying to find a solution to the issue altogether? Yeah. No, I mean, in fact, this morning we were sharing uh, in another round table that the total figure, not for Salesforce, but in terms of digital economy, tech economy, it's up to 150 million new jobs in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so probably the question is how, how are we going to fulfill huh? such, a, such a demand? Let, let me stick with you for a second, Alejandro, because I mean, you, you, you have, uh, I mean, I, I, I do agree with the, the future was yesterday. Huh? So it's true that we are talking about future of war, but many of those challenges are already here, or were yesterday on, on the table. Let, let's talk about for a second uh, about this uh, post-pandemic world in which the employees more than ever have evolved on their preferences, on their demands. So words such as flexibility, uh, project-driven engagements, uh, of course, wellness, uh, well-being, or work-life balance, whatever you want to call it, uh, have become you know, top of mind of, of many, many employees and have become uh, elements that are taken into account by employees when making a decision whether to work in Bank of the Credit or Salesforce or, or wherever. So you, uh, at least from, from Salesforce perspective, and Please feel free, that the rest of the panel, also to engage in the question. Who are you reacting to that? Are you, are you giving, I, I was having lunch with a, some colleagues from Mexico, and we were discussing about that. Uh, well, is the market going to tell us how the employee value proposition of our companies has to evolve? Are we going to be able to keep our essence, our culture, and offer the market whatever we feel is, is uh, appropriate? And we'll see. Pablo, this very special moment of history requires that we be relevant, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I can start by saying that the digital economy has very bad marketing. Mm -hmm. People are not aware of the opportunities that they would have by running uh, a life, uh, taking advantage of the employment opportunities that the industry mm -hmm. gives. So first things would be, to me, raise our voices, uh, make visible the opportunities that actually exist. Mm. It is not that you need to be a, uh, an IT geek to work in the industry. There are, of course, lots of, of opportunities for uh, very specialized people, but people with just a general culture and some knowledge of English may get into the market in like three to four months with the adequate training and with the adequate, I would say, babysitting. Mm. Because it is not only a matter of uh, uh, giving digital literacy to people. It is not uh, like a basic you mm. know, uh, uh, training in tech skills. It is a matter to me of building this virtual circle where you would make visible mm. these opportunities and we can't do this uh, just by, your, uh, by ourselves. We need the entire industry, mm. hand in hand with governments, with the right. academia, with the entire society, giving this visibility. Then making available the training opportunities that all of us, uh, all of us may have. We, for instance, have an online training platform that yeah. is free, that is called Trailhead, where you can learn in a funny way uh, the Salesforce technology. You can become certified uh, in Salesforce skills in, I can guarantee, three to four months to become mm. an administrator. But then it's a matter of helping that trained person become part of our ecosystem. Yeah. We shouldn't, I mean, we should go hand in hand throughout, through, throughout the whole process mm -hmm. and make sure that our ecosystem would find a spot for that person who has successfully been trained in that technology. Yeah. Any, any reactions? Uh, I would say Alejandro's <laughs> call to action is, is right on the spot. I need, we, we need to broaden, uh, broaden the funnel of, of, of supply of, of, of talent, especially for this digital new market. And it's not only by, by I think that if in Latin America we wait for our government to do something, we're going to grow old and die in the process. <laughs> so, so as companies, we need to actually grab that challenge and try to broaden that funnel and try to make it larger and more possible for 
disenfranchised people to, to learn these skills and to mm. join the workforce. Yeah. And, and actually, at Banco de Credito, we're trying to, to try with our tellers, the ones who had a, some, some technical uh, education. We're, make, we're making a pilot to try to see if they can work in, in, in our squads, in our you know, digital tech squads. So I think we need to grab that challenge and, and make it ours. Otherwise, we're going to wait for a long time. Mm. Okay, let, let me come back to, to you, Nicolas. I mean, we, we were discussing before the, the session around diversity, equity. So if we think, uh, especially in the digital world, right, and, mm -hmm. and more in particular in, in, Lat in Latin America, uh, the gender, uh, the diversity, the, the need for more uh, women. Uh, we, in yeah. Spain, we call it a women at tech. Huh? It's a, a common expression. Um, what do you think is the, is the right approach in order to, seek to not, not only to ensure uh, diversity, equity, but also to, to make this a uh, value driver? Because I think yeah. at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, we haven't discussed this uh, before, so. Yeah, yes, I love the, the question is not just about, you know, diversity, but also about how to approach it, right? Yeah. And I think that's, that's like the real, the really interesting point nowadays. Um, but also with what the panel was saying before of, of you know, the knowledge economy, I think it's a great thing for, for Latin America in particular. Mm. It's, it's a magical economy for, for it to drive value to our people. It's not like we are all only you know, for the, producing food for the rest mm -hmm. of the world. We are now producing knowledge and that, you know, it makes us rich as a continent and also <laughs> it makes our people happy as a community, right? It's, mm. it, it's, the economy of knowledge is one that produces happiness to the people that are involved in it. It really dignifies their lives. And I think that's really worth pointing out. But now <laughs> addressing your question about diversity, um, there's, one, one, there's not one approach. We have like a, a bouquet of approaches, right? Uh, and the first one is, of course, the principle. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. But then, there's also like the pragmatic one. It, it increases your productivity. Like unlimited mm -hmm. voices, it does you know, produce unlimited power, right? And, and then back again, when I was like thinking the other day in, in a workshop about this with our team, I started to think that, yeah, we, we have to think and we have to design policies and, and all of that, but also you start reflecting on, on the people that we have on our team and they are not like approaching diversity, they are diversity. It's like a lovely bunch of people. Yeah. And it's so, like it, it is a bless, and it is a joy to be with our mm. people in the technology uh, community because you really enjoy like diversity on a daily basis and you learn from them maybe more than what mm. they learn from us as the leadership of the, of the community that Glowant is, right? But it's all very nice, but we still got challenges yeah. pending to be solved, and we still got biases pending to be hacked. So in that sense, we have realized that we have to put objectives and, and KPIs or OKRs, whatever you want to call them, to measure how we progress you know, against those biases. And for example, we have a, a, a leadership and non-binary uh, uh, leadership composition of 50% that we have committed to achieve by the end of year 2025. Mm -hmm. And we like to say it because, you know, we're establishing a public commitment yeah. in that sense. But also, it just doesn't happen just for, you know, putting a, an indicator and a term. And, you know, you as a management consultant, you know that mm -hmm. just for putting an objective, things doesn't happen. So also we address it on a, you know, bottom-up kind of approach with a lot of programs like Women That Build that, you know, show society how women... In, in different stages of their career, inspire mm. other women and also the, the society in general, yeah. like when they're rising, when they're already developed as you know, figures that are very relevant, or maybe as our new category is a social influencers, and that yeah. connects with how people you know, nowadays live. So, so yeah, very, you know, ma a, a, a very you know, broad matter, but that needs to be addressed as it is, mm. a broad yeah. matter. Right? And, and, and do you think this new, reality, if you will, uh, this new way of working with more remote work, with more flexibility, uh, does, does it help in order to accelerate towards this uh, more yes. diverse workforce? Or? I think it, it helps to, to produce you know, 
satisfaction or, or happiness or engagement mm -hmm. in our people. And, and of course, diversity included um, in, in, in that sense. I think that when you do you know, the right things, usually a lot of good consequences happen. When you have like, the right you know, digital channels as a bank, you know, customer experience improves, but mm -hmm. also efficiency improves. Yeah. So it, it all happens together. Like there's a virtuous cycle that, that just happens. So yes, it helps you with the purpose mm -hmm. that you give to your people. It helps you, you know, with the happiness and flexibility that, that people get, like working mm -hmm. from everywhere or working at the exact right career or projects that, that they yeah. have. Or maybe, you know, facing uh, like a more aggressive career path for the next two years because you are, you know, up to that circumstance and you want to take more risk. Mm -hmm. And we have that kind of program in which, you know, different projects and different business units compete among each other for our own talent, right? Yeah. As if it yeah. was a, an open market. So, so definitely yes to your yeah. question. Okay. I have to jump in. Sure, please. Um, <laughs> So uh, just a very quick scan and inviting the audience to participate. How many of you are Latinos? How many of you live in the United States? How many of you work for an American company? Okay, beautiful, thank you. So um, did you know that uh, Latinos uh, only held, uh, hold 4% of seats in the boards of, um, mm -hmm. of uh, Fortune uh, 1000 mm -hmm. companies? There is a very big gap in the diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not only about the gender gap, it's also about a leadership gap. So uh, this is something that definitely uh, should be addressed. The gender gap is uh, an opportunity of over $12 uh, trillion in additional GDP uh, for, for um, globally. And the US Latino wage gap is $288 US billion. So we need to start tapping into how we also account mm -hmm. the remote force into uh, these Latino employers and, these, and, and, and give more power to these Latino mm -hmm. employees to, to upskill and reskill. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Karim, let, let me come back to you. So we, so we have been talking about employees, employee value proposition, talent, digital talent, blah, blah, blah. Let, let, let's talk about for a second, let's talk about us. Let's talk about the HR professionals, the people uh, that dedicate uh, a fair amount of time uh, to these HR topics uh, for a living. Are, are, we, are we, are they ready to deal with these challenges? Mm, I'm going to be very unpopular now. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. Um, uh, and actually I said in the morning, and I will repeat it again, that we need to bring non-HR people into HR. And what has happened, especially in, in, in some of our companies mm -hmm. in Latin America, is that we had, uh, let's call it classical HR practitioners that are dealing with processes, not with the business. So you need people in HR that know the business inside out and then can help the business co-create solutions. And, and, and I remember when I, when I first, I'm not from, by the way, it's easy for me to say this because I'm not from HR. I worked in a capital market division and when I went to HR, people told me, you are mad. And actually, the first day at work, I said, what am I doing here? But then, I, then you learn that through your knowledge of business, you can really tap into, into, into the power of, of, of making solutions that are, that are more tailor-made for, for, for what the company needs, not for what HR needs. So you have to look at your, yeah. you know, at, at, your own, at your own button belly, you know, you have to look outside. So I think that's a, a main challenge we have. And then also you have to, and I said it earlier, you have to reorganize your, your HR and reskill them. This is very important. Someone mentioned it in the morning and, and, and left me thinking that reskilling HR is also important. We have to do that. And, and uh, I'm going to put an example. If you want to bring digital profiles, for example, a Java backend developer, and you put a psychologist, classical HR, mm. to try to interview them, what do you think is going to happen? You're not going to speak the same language, yeah. and you're not going to be able to hire no one. So you need to bring people that speak that language in order to deal with that hiring and acquisition process. So it's, 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 it works in many different ways. So I think, again, going back to your question, Pablo, I think, mm. We are not ready, and we need to, to, to really think a bit 
better in how to organize ourselves and how to skill ourselves. Yeah. Any reactions? Uh, or, or, or any non-HR executive willing and able to join the, uh, the HR career? I will be thrown into the pond later on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it is true. I mean, for, for many years we have been the arguing that uh, HR or people has to become a true business partner of the business units of the corporate functions. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's hard for anybody to be a partner of something that is not familiar with, right? So it, it is true that uh, for many years we have seen HR kind of as a silo function. And more and more, I mean, you, you, you say you, you don't come from originally from HR, neither I am. I, I, I didn't start my career as an HR specialist. 80% uh, of the CHROs of EVEX 35 companies in Spain had been less than 10 years working in HR positions. Well, I think it's kind of interesting. A, yeah. yeah, Alejandro. I would say, Pablo, that every single leader at any organization has to take his or her HR portion, mm -hmm. and we are all responsible and accountable yeah. for making that employee feel welcome, feel at home, and be able to develop his or her entire yeah. potential. Yeah. So we are all HR responsible. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially in this kind of operations, mm -hmm. right? Especially in this, in this mm -hmm. sector. Uh, you know, many times banks call themselves nowadays tech companies, right? Yeah. And we as a tech company, we sometimes say that we're not a tech company, we're a people company, <laughs> right? So, so I think that is definitely <laughs> like a definition of the job spec, mm -hmm. that a people that. officer uh, you know, needs, needs to be the, the business partnership is, is for sure a key. And I think not only for people, like a good CFO now, nowadays needs to be a business partner, mm -hmm. a good people officer even more, right? And, and that is key and, and that is something that when you're lacking, you suffer and when you have, it, it's a blessing, right? It's actually a, a yeah. value enabler, many times a value driver because sometimes they tell you like, hey, you're, you're not seeing this blind spot. Yeah, it's no, very absolutely. interesting. Absolutely. Hey, uh, in, in the interest of time, let me, let me jump uh, to, to a final question to, to the four of you. Uh, I mean, for many years, I think all of us have been discussing about how to create sustainable competitive advantage, right? So, and there has been around uh, new product development, pricing strategies, customer journeys, uh, location, whatever, a number of factors that have been you know, used to try to, to create and to sustain that competitive advantage. What about competitive advantage based on people's strategy, based on talent? Is that possible? And, and if so, how do you think uh, we, we should be trying to create that? I'm, I'm a managing consultant, so the, the only asset, the only competitive advantage that I have is my people. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. But what, what, what about you guys? Uh, what do you think? Yes, it's like. Well, in our case, like, maybe like, the only engine of competitive advantage is our people. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's not something that we have to think about. It's the essence of our business model, the essence of our operational model. If we don't have that, we are out of business. So I don't know, even, even for ourselves, who, you know, we live off Technology, of course, you know, lots of trends like low code, no code. Anyhow, that, and we do have an operation of mm -hmm. low code and we bought a company and we're very proud of it. But anyhow, that company was set up by a bunch of brilliant people, mm -hmm. right? And I think that we are also quite smart of addressing that opportunity. But in any case, talent is everything for us. Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer with a simple equation. Transformation equals technology plus talent. Mm -hmm. No talent, no transformation. There you go. But if I may, Karim, uh, if you have an asset, you have a product that uh, doesn't work, it's a failure, you have to do a write-off on your balance sheet, right? Uh, if you buy a company and there is uh, some value on those assets, there's, you, you have to account for that. You have to pay for that. Where do, you, where, where do we account? for human capital. What is that human capital in the valuation of our companies? Okay, I'm going to make it 
a very provocative question, and I want to go the long answer, but then again, in a bank, for example, in a financial mm -hmm. institution, 50% of your costs is people. If you mm -hmm. don't manage that, that cost properly, yeah. and you have a strategy that will make you successful, you're going to fail. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to make it more, you know, so this real world, a real world <laughs> answer, you know. It's in the PNL then. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do in my Alejandro? case, I think it's the two sides of a coin. For the mm -hmm. private sector, we are going back to the issue of the lack of resources. We mm -hmm. keep struggling to get the adequate resources at the right time, and we don't pay that much attention to making the pie go bigger. Uh -huh. So uh, for us, it's a must. I mean, the, there's yeah. no way we will be successful in the future if we don't bring uh, millions of new talented people into our ecosystems. And in the case of governments, I really don't see how they don't see the opportunity. I mean, with so many people lacking a job, mm. I mean, promoting this type of initiatives, these private-public partnerships, where citizens would be trained at scale, mm. would make them become much more popular than they probably are. Yeah. So, I can't see why not using the, the most of that coin yeah. that we have in our hands. Yeah. Dina? Um, look at where the uh, FDI is, all the FDI flow is going. Uh, investors, uh, manufacturers are looking for the talent pool. Uh, United States and Canada are highly investing in North America because they don't have the talent in their homes to, to, to build products. Um, so I, I think it's going to be key, uh, the talent attraction, but also the talent retention. Why? Because it's about productivity. It's about starting to talk mm -hmm. about bringing the work to the worker and not bringing the worker to work, which we are now defining as labor mobility. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much. I, I know we have had to compact a bit the, uh, the session because of the, the agenda. Just in time. Yeah, <laughs> the, wow. the, the timer is, you know, quite straightforward. So thank you so much. Please. I think it's a, hopefully the beginning of a series of conversation on people mm -hmm. and talent Pleasure. strategy uh, in, the, in the Council of America. So thank you so much for attending this session. And to next year. All right, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, today's closing discussion focuses on private sector alliances for development. Please welcome to the stage Darren Ware, Senior Vice President of Government Engagement for Latin America at MasterCard, and Juan Pablo Mata, CEO of Apex, Grupo Mariposa, along with our moderator, Enrique Bolanos, President of INCAE Business School, to discuss the contributions and next steps for the Partnership for Central America. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I believe we are the ones in the middle between this and the final break. We're the last ones in the session. Our topic today is a uh, conversation about the partnership uh, for Central America. In May 2021, Vice President Harris called on the private sector, both in the region and uh, global in the U.S., to draw on their resources and make a commitment to support inclusive economic growth in Central America, specifically 
in the three countries of the north, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. To put it into a little bit of a context, let me just describe a little bit uh, how we see the situation. These three countries have a relatively low GDP per capita. They have a high level of poverty, limited economic growth. The last decade, the growth has been very limited. High levels of migration, mostly to the US. Therefore, highly dependent on remittances. As such, the young population, the demographic bonus, as we call it, is being slightly lost because they are migrating. And this really challenges on democracy, rule of law, corruption, organized crime. On the other side, is a region with significant opportunities. Uh, we're close to the U.S. market. The near-shoring opportunities that have been described earlier today are upon the region to take advantage of them. They have huge tourism uh, situations in which it can be improved. If you look at Central America in total, the GDP is greater than Colombia, so it's an important market. It's not insignificant, uh, such as the U.S. many years ago did a... Uh, trade agreement, a free trade agreement with the region, and the geopolitical situation today works in the favor, and hopefully we can take advantage of that. Over 40 companies have committed over $3 billion to invest in the region, so these companies have really seen the opportunity and look forward to working in the region. I have here with me today uh, Darren Ware from uh, MasterCard and uh, Juan Pablo from uh, uh, Mata from uh, Apex Mariposa. Uh, Darren, a uh, global company, uh, joined uh, the partnership initially at the beginning. MasterCard is a, an organization, a company that has committed uh, to bring digital knowledge to a billion people in the world, and you have committed yourself to working and supporting in this region. Could you talk to us and relate to us, because financial inclusion is definitely very important for the development of the region, how you correlate your global objective with what you are doing in these three countries. Thank you, Enrique, and thanks to Council of the Americas for the invitation. So when we committed to the Partnership for Central America in May of 2021, what we were doing was to say we would do financial inclusion in the region of Central America, in the northern part of Central America, because we have been doing this around the world to the tune of over 600 million people in the last few years, from 2015, when we first set a goal of including 500 million people in the financial system. We achieved that goal in 2020 and then said, let's do a billion, because 500 million is only, only half of the, the thing we need to do. We've done over 600 million people now around the world, or we've included 600 million people. So when we, we started looking at um, our commitment to PCA, we decided we wanted to also drive financial inclusion of individuals as well as of small and medium businesses. So 5 million people and 1 million small and medium businesses are our goals for inclusion in Central America. The way we do that is, of course, like we're talking about today, it's all about private-public partnerships. My role is to work with governments. Governments control very often um, a large part of the economy and they have financial inclusion in their interest as they move away from cash in their local economy or drive their digital agenda. We also work with the private sector, of course, uh, with the banks, with the fintechs, because we can't drive financial inclusion by ourselves. We have to work with the local banking um, institutions, the financial institutions, the fintechs, and other payment industry um, participants to be able to deliver the kinds of products and services required to participate in the formal financial services economy. Uh, thank you, Darren. Juan Pablo, uh, you're a different uh, organization. You're a local Guatemalan organization, a multi-Latina, as we would call it, very different than MasterCard, a global company. You joined PCA. Uh, could you share with us your experiences, why you joined, and what you see is coming out of this uh, effort done by PCA? Yes, uh, thank you, Enrique, and, and thank you to the Council of the America. Um, it's an honor to be here, and we are, we are a food and beverage uh, conglomerate. We operate in the, in the Americas, um, in 20 market, but we were born in, in, in Guatemala, and we have a deep commitment in the region. Um, today, earlier at the, at, at the conference, I, I, I heard a quote that says that the mission 
is what keeps you up at night, and the purpose is what gets you up in the morning. And as a group, uh, our purpose is to unleash value, uh, to catalyze inclusive growth and prosperity. And that's the key component why um, we believe that the partnership uh, could unleash lots of the value that uh, we have in the Northern Triangle. Uh, today, when we look at the past 15 years, uh, we see that even though uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of opportunities, uh, when you look at the investment uh, that has uh, entered the region, uh, there's a lot of complexity and opportunities for that investment to get to the rural, rural uh, areas and to generate prosperity. Uh, and I think that's a key component of the partnership. How can we, uh, the companies that, that join, uh, bring investment, but most importantly, how can we uh, make sure that we work together so that we can generate progress uh, and prosperity and it could be sustainable. So that's, that's why Grupo Mariposa um, has been a part of the partnership uh, and we are very excited. There's a lot of collaboration that we have uh, been doing with MasterCard and with many companies that have joined. And we have been learning together uh, and understanding how can we truly move the needle uh, on, the, on the key components of the partnership. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Uh, <clears throat> Juan Pablo made uh, the comment about uh, really bringing the investment into the rural area. Uh, I know MasterCard has uh, sponsored initiatives in the area. We talked earlier about them. One of them is uh, women's leadership that MasterCard supported uh, the case of Pili, for example. Uh, the one you shared in El Salvador. Could you share a little bit about that so we can see how the, the effort by PCA and MasterCard is, is getting into that rural area? Sure, so th there's an example we have where we had supported INCAI actually previously through a program called Leeds Mujer, which trained women um, who had their own business and took them through a, a, a training program, nurturing, coaching, all of these things. This woman, Pili Luna, uh, is the owner of Vos Honduras, uh, which is a company that produces fish leather for use in high fashion accessories, shoes, and things like that. So we had been doing that and working with INCAI before we even started with PCA. Now we have been able to support her between MasterCard and Inkai to bring her into other places, even uh, at the Summit of the Americas where she got to meet Kamala Harris, to tell her the story of how she has created a company which she is also trying to use to pay forward and teach um, the artisan women how to work with fish leather, a recyclable natural material that they can use then um, to, instead of simply throwing it away, they can use it to produce something else and to produce their own businesses and participate in this, um, this new opportunity. That's the kind of thing where the reason why we often invest in women-owned businesses or gender initiatives, for example, just like Pili has done, the women owners very often invest, reinvest in health and education so much more than a than a man owner of the business. So, and Pili is a great example. We're doing more of that today even uh, with Inkai, with Cargill, um, Price Smart in conjunction with the PCA to do another 120 women-owned businesses where we work with them to continue to try and coach, bring them along, educate, and, and really inspire them to do more. Because again, they pay back, they, they inspire others, and that's a, that's a really untapped resource in this region. I see a synergy here between what MasterCard has just described that you're doing with an example of Pili and what you, Juan Pablo, described about the purpose of Grupo Mariposa. We at INCAI measure what we call the Social Progress Index, which is basically how can you turn economic development into the well-being of the population in general. The index in, our, in these three countries has maintained itself, but uh, the ranking per, in, a, in a list of countries has deteriorated in the last 10 years. You have 70,000 tienditas that you're moving forward to try to bring digital uh, inclusion to the population in Guatemala. How do you link that index with the tiendas to really bring and, and improve the quality of the life of a lot of the people that you, imp that you impact in your countries? Yes, yeah, so, 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 so to give you an example, um, 
in, in, in Guatemala, our main business uh, has been to serve the small tiendas, the, the mom and pop stores. Um, and, and that has given us um, a lot of understanding of the communities. Um, in, in, in the pandemic, we, we, we saw how important are the, these small SMEs uh, for the communities. They are the heart and soul of the communities, is where the communities get access to, to products, basic need products, and, and there's, there's, there's a big role of these tiendas um, in the communities. Uh, in Latin America, we reached two million tiendas uh, on a weekly basis, uh, and we saw a big opportunity uh, through technology uh, to transform these tiendas so that they can grow uh, and, and take not only products but services uh, to the community so that, so that communities can progress. Um, so we, we have been working uh, at the PCA uh, to really understand this uh, tendero. Um, we, 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 uh, a reflection that we had as a group is uh, today um, the, the, the formal sector, it's the most important enabler for growth in the region. But for a small tienda owner, it's very hard. It's very hard to be formal. It's very hard to grow. There are so many tenderos and so many families that they want to have a path to prosperity. And because of the external factors, they have a very big challenge. Uh, and as a company, uh, uh, working together, um, we can really help these uh, dreamers uh, to really get access to technology uh, and to, to, to improve, uh, grow, uh, and that could uh, impact the community. So what we are doing is understanding what are the levers of growth uh, for the tiendas. Uh, and one of the most important component is uh, financial inclusion. Um, these tiendas have a hard uh, time growing their business because they have limited access to, to, to capital. Uh, another important enabler for the tienda is the connectivity. Um, so we have been working uh, to provide connectivity and to provide access uh, to capital to the tiendas. Once the tienda is connected, they can improve their service to uh, services, payment services. They can get access to education. They can bring education uh, to the communities. They can be a big in, a important enabler for education um, uh, to the communities. So that's what we are, have been uh, focusing on. Uh, generating uh, a growth uh, for the tiendas uh, through transforming them through technology. Uh, Darren, um, uh, following up on one, the Juan Pablo said, uh, to continue this evolution, this uh, financial inclusion, two questions in one. What would you consider to be a fully inclusive financial system, how it would look like, and what are the main barriers that you find into reaching that objective? So fully inclusive would, would mean that everyone has access to the kinds of products and services that they need for them, whether that's an individual who wants to perhaps start with a prepaid card, uses a debit card later on, and then eventually moves up to a credit card. Or for a small and medium business, like Juan Pablo said, at the beginning they start with basic account, but later on if they are building credit by using a credit card, then they have a credit history, then they can move into having a loan and further enable the sustainability of their business. Now, what are the barriers to these, um, to, to full inclusion? There are many barriers. One can be connectivity as well. So many of the first time financial inclusion, you know, people coming into the system, it might happen on a mobile wallet or a mobile device. And so the more connections that we have, more connectivity and access that we have, the more people are going to be enabled. That's why Microsoft's objective in the PCA is broadband connections. Mm -hmm. And that's why we work with them. And we have an example working with them to drive small and medium mobile acceptance on a, on a telephone, right, on a phone, POS acceptance. Um, but other barriers are, are even as simple as not trusting either in the banking system, thinking it's expensive, when being um, in the informal economy is often actually very expensive as well. Mm -hmm. Receiving remittances or paying for someone for a very short term high cost loan because it's in cash, because it's very short term, that can be expensive. That's something we're also trying to drive down the cost of remittances and to increase the capacity of credit in the countries so that businesses can also use this and be more sustainable. Thank you, Darren. Um, we're almost at the end of our time. We've been 
ask to manage it as best as we can. Perhaps one question to Juan Pablo. Uh, we've talked about financial inclusion. We've talked about the needs of uh, you know women entrepreneurs, the small tenditas. We have $3.2 billion of investments that are committed already to the region. We have 40 companies committed to it, some of them uh, multi-Latinas like you. But uh, <clears throat> you talked earlier that if all of the investment is done in Guatemala City, we really haven't addressed the issue of how to develop and bring the inclusion into the rural areas. You're bringing financial inclusion there. Investment is equivalent to economic growth, and economic growth adds to prosperity. You know, any final thoughts as to how this partnership, this alliance between corporations, which are the driving agent of prosperity, can be pushed into the rural areas to really transform the lives of the people and have them stay at home and have a future and not have to migrate? Yes. Uh, there's, there's three objectives that the PCA define. One um, is to boost the GDP per capita. Uh, the second one is uh, generating more than 4 million uh, em employments. Uh, and the third one is reduce poverty by 15%. Um, so all, all efforts uh, and initiatives are aligned towards achieving those uh, targets. Those targets are obviously not short term. It takes time and consistency uh, to really uh, work and, and, and for the initiatives to be sustainable, scalable, and financially viable. So that's, that's I think, the, the challenge that, that uh, the PCA and all the efforts and initiatives that have been going on in the region have. Um, and I think that the most important component is um, to really track um, the, the, the advancements, what works and what doesn't work, uh, and work together in collaboration. Uh, there, there, there's many efforts that have been uh, pursue in the region, and there's a few uh, uh, learnings from those efforts, so we keep committing the same uh, uh, mistakes. So there's, there's for me, uh, uh, an important component of learning uh, together, collaborating together uh, as companies, the public and the private uh, sector, uh, and find ways that um, the, the initiatives are sustainable, and sustainable uh, in the medium and long term. Um, I think that we have a very unique opportunity, as you mentioned, Enrique, uh, because of all uh, the geopolitical. Um, in Central America, it's incredible. Um, the demogra demographic bonus is one of the best demographic bonus in the, in the, in the region. So the time is now, and, and you see uh, the companies, multinational companies uh, that have been uh, participating in the partnership that they are interested in the region, not only because of, of the opportunities to generate progress, but because there's a, a huge opportunity to generate value uh, for, for the companies. There's gonna be growth um, in the region, so the time is now. I think that uh, in, in Central America, uh, there's a new generation uh, that wants to be part of the solution, and we're willing uh, to, to work hard to, to make a difference and to really change and, 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 and move progress in the region. With that final comment from Juan Paulo, we're going to have to close. I, perhaps my final words are at INCAE, at our business school, we are proud to have uh, strategic alliances with both MasterCard and uh, with Mariposa. And uh, re really, I hope uh, the comments made by both Darren and Juan Pablo bring you an idea of the opportunities that the region brings to everybody which is value for the investors and really economic growth and development for the three countries. Thank you all for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. This concludes our 2022 Council of the American Symposium. Thank you once again for joining us today and we hope to see you again next year. Gracias, Enrique. Un gusto verte, ahí te vi solo de... Derek?